in 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 the hub today we have a subject matter expert dr muhammad mputu who's going to take us through the session for today and then we have subject matter experts uh, we'll have Dr. Chimzizi, Dr. Monde Muyoyeta, we we'll also have Marshall Sikandangwa and uh, Judy Mzieche, Winnie Mwanza, all who are experts from the National TB and Leprosy Program and other implementing partners supporting the TB um, program. So without uh, spending much time, Allow me to quickly share the screen so that we have Dr. Mpu to take us through the session for today. He will introduce himself and his role when he starts presenting. As I'm sharing this, dear network, just remind you of the echo etiquette that you should keep your microphone muted unless you are on the floor to speak. Also, remember to utilize the chat box uh, when you have questions during the didactic presentation. After the didactic presentation, we'll have um, a few moments to discuss what will be presented and thereafter we'll transition to have a case coming from Kawe Women and Newborn Hospital that's coming all the way from Central Province. So, colleagues, please uh, in the chat box just confirm if you can see my screen and I'll invite Dr. Mpu to, to take us through the session. Dr. Mputu. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I hope I'm loud and clear. So um, the session was, I was, I was just supposed to be on the panel, listening to it. Uh, the person was the uh, mark to do the, the didactic presentation was the uh, Dr. Lungu, but Dr. Lungu and myself, but I managed to escape with him is still uh, held up in the training. So we are conducting a training at the Murungushi Conference Center, so I couldn't come. So in this place, I'm going to present, but I'm also supposed to be part of the panel of experts. So I'll, I'll be doing both roles. So uh, this afternoon, I'll give you some uh, talking point for Douglas and TB. It's not exhaustive, but I think from the, what we discussed is something that will make you comfortable uh, in terms of uh, dealing with patients with drug resistant uh, tuberculosis. So um, the, uh, the function as a, an advisor with the National TB Reference Program on the DRTB side, I'm also a physician based at the University Teaching Hospital uh, under the nephrology unit. So my schedule is kind of hectic then there. So we we'll start with the uh, objective of uh, the presentations. Uh, most of you already know how to define drug resistant TB, but to, a reminder wouldn't harm, wouldn't be harmful. We'll describe the epidemiology of drug resistant TB in Zambia, and then talk about diagnostic uh, modalities and the uh, particular interpretation of results. And then we we'll see about treatment options that are available in the country. So just as, as at that onset, I would like to, to inform all of you that the past few months, we've been wait, wait, working in the background. In fact, we started some, some time last year in updating our drug resistant, uh, our national TB guidelines. So there will, there will be called consolidated TB guidelines. So you will notice some, some of the things that I may mention may be something new. Uh, so don't get alarmed because you, you are going to be receiving the, the guidelines very soon. Uh, they are already they are ready for print. So very soon we'll be start disseminating the guidelines. So this is also another platform that I'll use to disseminate, disseminate the guidelines. Next. Yeah. So we start with the poll question. Uh, right. So the first poll question reads, what is a recommended action for expert RR in determinate results? So we are going to have three poll questions in series. Um, and we we'll start with the very first one. So the first one is, what is a recommended action for expert RR in determinate results? Option A, treat with first line drugs and refer specimen for culture and uh, DST. 
B, simply treat with the first line drugs as the patient is unlikely to have RRTB. C, refer specimen for culture and TST. And then D, retrain laboratory staff as RR indeterminate results are due to poor laboratory skills. So there you have it, network, very simple question. Uh, we invite you to pick the best answer of the four options. Right, so we have over 220 participants on the call and um, looking forward to seeing as many people as possible participate in this call so that we gauge um, what part of the presentation Dr. Mputu needs to put more emphasis on. All right, I'll just give it a few seconds before we get to the next poll question. Please remember that these polls and the answers that you submit, no one can see them. And uh, I am unable to tell who has polled for which option. And therefore, I invite you to actually participate in this because they are anonymous. Okay, more than 50% have taken part in today's poll. Um, I'll end this poll and quickly display the results for you and then transition to the next poll. There we have it, network. 65% of everyone that poured thought A was the correct answer, which is treat with first line drugs and refer for uh, culture and uh, drug sensitivity testing. Right. So I'll stop sharing and then move on to the second poll question. Right. So the second poll question says, in which category of patients should expert, I beg your pardon, in which category of patients should an expert MTB detected trace result be interpreted with caution for treatment decision? I'll repeat that. In which category of patients should an expert MTB detected trace result be interpreted with caution for treatment decision? Very interesting um, question there. Keyword trace, you understand later. So um, option A says patient with a history of TB in their entire lifetime, uh, rather with in their entire lifetime. B, patient without a history of TB within the past five years. C, a patient with history of TB within the past five years. D, patient with history of TB and prior TB treatment uh, more than 10 years ago. Very interesting polling that's happening. And I'll repeat the question. In which category of patients should an expert MTB detected trace result be interpreted with caution for treatment decision? All right, we're still less than 50% of the network having polled on this one. I acknowledge it's a very interesting question, but would want to get your, your thoughts on this particular subject. I'll give it a few more seconds just for us to hit the 60% mark. We're waiting for you to give us your thoughts. And do not worry about getting a wrong answer at this stage. Um, it will help us just to understand the knowledge gap for the network. Right, so I'll stop here and share the results. Okay, there you go. The majority of the network thinks C is the correct answer, which is patients with the history of TB within the last, within the past five years. Uh, that was what the majority thought was the correct answer. We still had a few that thought A was the correct answer, a patient without TB history, rather a patient without history of TB in their entire lifetime as one of the options and the, the remainder were split between option B and C, rather and D. Right, last poll question in this series. This is a very unique way of doing the session. And here we go. The, the last poll question says, 
What is the recommended course of action with a laboratory result of MTB detected? What is the recommended course of action with the laboratory result of MTB detected? Option A, start four FDCs, those based on the weight. B, request the laboratory to provide RR status before starting the patient on treatment. C, start the patient on treatment and ask the patient to come after two weeks with a new gene expert result. And D, repeat sputum gene expert. Very interesting questions. I hope we are seeing um, some, some interesting concepts that these questions are bringing up from the first one to this one. I'll give you a few seconds to, um, to pour and give us your options, and then we'll dive back into the didactic presentation and we'll have the Tambu to lead us on it. Right, very impressive um, polling pattern so far. And I can see that the majority of the network have um, given us their thoughts and many more are still polling. So I'll just give it five more seconds, specifically for you. There we go. I'll end the poll now and uh, share the results. So we've had about 180 out of 278 people participating. And these are the results. 56% of those that poured thought A was the correct answer, that you need to start the four fixed drug combination for TB based on weight. And uh, we had um, another group of people who thought B was the correct answer. 29% thought B was the correct answer and 13% thought C was the correct answer. And 2% uh, thought D was the correct answer. Dr. Mpoto, there you have it. Uh, you can see how the voting patterns have been on the last, on the on the first three polls. Yeah. I will invite you to take us through the next few slides. Okay, the uh, very interesting uh, poll uh, results. Okay, uh, just to give you some idea of the problem that the country is facing in terms of uh, drug based and TB. If you look, uh, if you look at the First graph there on top that shows from the, the uh, enrollment of uh, uh, notification enrollment of patients since 2015. You'll notice that there's been a trend uh, upwards since then. Uh, this is partly explained with the availability of uh, gene experts. Those of you who may have been in the system before 2015, you will notice that gene expert was stationed at the specific. Uh, what I call privileged sites like UTH, but the other sites would not have such uh, access to gene expert testing. But since then, almost every almost every district has access to uh, expert machines. So this is one of the reasons why we started picking up a lot of uh, of cases as of twenty uh, twenty as of twenty twenty one. Actually, which is not shown here. We had reached as far, you had reached over 500 uh, uh, cases. So this signifies the, 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 that there's a, a, an, a burden of uh, drug resistant TB uh, that is threatening all efforts that we are all doing in, term, in terms of eliminating uh, TB. At the same time, uh, previously there was used to be a gap where uh, persons, persons detected with drug resistant TB were uh, not started on, uh, on drug resistant TB. That's the bottom line that shows it's, it's the pink, I think, uh, that there's been a challenge in ensuring that uh, everyone uh, who's detected with drug resistant TB is, is started on, on TB. The bottom uh, uh, graph speaks the same thing, but it's just in a histogram form just to, to get an idea of what we are, what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. This is shows the notification versus enrollment. Uh, enrollment. So you see that the, 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 the percentages started improving after 2018. 
before 20, uh, in 2015, for example, only 51% of people who are drug resistant TB actually were put on treatment. In 2017, only 49% of people who were found to have drug resistant TB were put on, on TB. In 2020, uh, although theoretically it's not possible to have 108, the essential, essential message there is that in 2020, we managed to put everyone on drug resistant TB. So it's the same as for last year, almost everyone was put on drug resistant TB. So this shows that there's been a uh, significant effort in ensuring that we put all the patients that we detect on, on drug resistant TB. So the key message is here that we are detecting a lot of drug resistant TB cases. Uh, although we had the gaps in the initiating treatment, we have made some headway in ensuring that most of our patients at least have been put on a second line uh, drugs. Next. Yeah, so the other good thing uh, that we've managed to do is that we are seeing an increase in terms of uh, treatment success rate in those patients who are started on, uh, on second line drugs. So if you see from 2015, there's been a number of, uh, there, there's been, uh, we have improved from about 60% in 2015, we were about 78% 70, even as of uh, 20, uh, 2021. So this speaks to uh, uh, one, one contributing factor is that we, we've been detecting uh, cases early on time uh, with using our gene expert because uh, the patient sputum was subjected. So we are detecting these cases early and we are initiating them on treatment treat, on, treatment on time. So, that's, so that improves their outcome. So the key message here again is that the, the, the faster you detect the other case, and the faster you start treatment, the more out, the better the outcome for for that patient will be. Next. So over 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 the years, uh, the like I was saying, the treatment outcome, the, the treatment outcome, treatment success has been has improved. That's what's showing in, in green. If you look at 2010 uh, up to 2018, you can see generally that there's been proven in treatment success. But even, even now, they, they, we are still seeing a number, a significant number of people still dying or we are, we are losing to follow up. And then there's also a significant number of patients that are not being evaluated. So we are trying to understand why some of these patients are not being evaluated so that we don't know what, is, what has happened to them, whether they died or something has happened to them. So along the way, we can't tell. But Generally, our treatment success rate uh, has, uh, has, has improved. In the next, uh, this year, we are going to, 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 to undertake an activity to understand these things even further to, uh, to, to based on the treatment that you'll be, you'll be seeing. So some of, some of you will see some of us at your facilities uh, will come looking for data to understand uh, these treatment outcomes based on the treatment regimen the patient, the patient was on. So children have also not left have not been left behind. Uh, we we've seen an increase in the number of uh, pediatric cases uh, from 18, for example, in 2016. As of 2020, we had recorded up to 14 uh, 14 cases. So there's somehow it's very slow. Uh, we'd like to see more of uh, patient, uh, pediatric cases of drug resistant TB, but uh, we can't take away from what we've done so far. Uh, we can see that from, from almost single D, from single digit, we are now in double, double digit. So we hope with the, with the implementation of the uh, two gene expert text, testing, this is going to uh, increase uh, in case detection for, for children. Then in the recent past, there's been the campaigns on uh, childhood uh, TB, and then there's also a, a focus on the weekly reporting on childhood TB that we expect that will maintain the momentum for detecting uh, TB, not just drug resistant TB, even drugs as for TB uh, in children. So please, uh, do not, let's not forget uh, the children. Uh, we shouldn't leave them behind. Next. So uh, I'll, I'll skip this slide. Okay, next. Yeah, so uh, here I want to highlight, uh, highlight, uh, highlight something. We are, we are, we are seeing uh, for some 
uh, reasons that we've tried to understand, we have we've noticed that there's been a lower, I know there are a lot of, a lot of buzz, just listen to me, don't need to memorize those buzz. All I'm saying here is that there's been a low uh, case detection, in, especially this year, where we, are, we seem to be missing a lot of, of cases for drug resistant TB. Uh, we are trying to understand why. On one hand, we are seeing a lot of bacteriologically confirmed drug resistant TB, but for bacteriological confirmed susceptible TB, but for Douglas and TB, we, we seem not to, to, to pick it up. So one, one, one of the next, one of the possible explanation, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the board. I'll come back to this slide again. Yeah, one of the possible explanation is that the, the burden of Douglas and TB uh, as from the last GRIS survey that was done in 2008 uh, versus the new, the latest GRIS survey shows that there's a, no significant in, increase in, the term, in terms of uh, the burden of drug resistant TB. So this could be part, part explanation why we're not seeing an explana exponential increase in the case uh, case detection of drug resistant TB. And the other possible explanation is that we, as clinicians, clinicians who put our, our gut down uh, and we've come, sorry to use the word, we've, we've become lazy, where we are not thinking beyond the uh, patient symptoms or we are, we are not thinking about risk factors. So we are missing a potential cases of, of drug resistant uh, uh, TB because of our low index of, of, of suspicion. So I'll take you back to two slides. Yeah, so whichever province you are coming from, you can easily picture, you can see, you can easily see yourself in terms of where you are in terms of drug test and TB. Because this data is for this year, for this year only. You can see that most of the, most of the cases for drug test and TB actually come from Lusaka and Copper Belt. And the two provinces are also lagging behind. I think they are both, Lusaka is working around the uh, uh, 74, 65, actually 65% for Copper Belt and the 74% for, for the Saka province. So these two provinces are the main contributors of uh, drug test and TB. We've, we've had challenges from Eastern province where the cases of uh, detection, the, the rate of detection is actually very slow. Sometimes it can go for a whole three months. They don't pick up a case. So we, we need to understand some of these uh, uh, things. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that was just to give you a data picture of drug resistant TB picture, what you are the, the country is struggling with and what the country has achieved in terms of uh, figures and numbers. So definitions of, uh, of uh, different types of drug resistant TB have, have been proposed. And in recently, only two uh, changes have been made. Uh, that's that regards to PXDR and XDR. So these are the two updated definitions that you are seeing on your screen. So for MDR infamous resistant, uh, we, when we talk about MDR TB, we are talking about uh, a strain that is resistant to both infamous and uh, isonazide. This can be just for these pure two drugs, or it can be in combination with other drugs. So that that qualifies as MDR TB. So MDR TB, uh, by definition, is laboratory defini definition. So most of the most of the uh, results you get initially will just indicate that the patient has uh, MTB detected, rifampicin resistant detected. But to say that the patient has the MDR, you need laboratory confirmation. That's why you see that there's a when you have MDR when you have gene expert results, the the where you are supposed to indicate for that patient is supposed to indicate as MDR slash RR, MTB. That's what, that's what it is. When the, the results, DST results comes out, then you can indicate that he, this is a confirmed case of uh, MDR. For the definition of pre-XDR, so pre-XDR is simply a strain that has, has fulfilled the definition of MDR, and there's also uh, resistance to fluoroquinolone. And again here, you require the laboratory uh, definition. So you, you require the laboratory confirmation to say that your patient has the uh, pre-XDR. So pre-XDR pre previously used to include the injectables, 
If you notice that we, are, we don't give injectables, that's a, the, main, the main difference there. So without inject, we don't consider injectables in the definitions. So for XDR, we are talking about a, a, a patient who has MDR, is also resistant to fluoroquinolone, and is also resistant to at least one additional group A, uh, a drug. So WHO classifies um, second line drugs into three major groups, group A, group B, and group C. We do have other forms of uh, uh, resistances of, uh, that may not necessarily uh, fulfill the criteria of XDR up, XDR or MDR. Uh, we do have, for, for example, we can have patients with the rifampicin monoresistance. We can have a patient with INH monoresistance. We can also have patients who can have polydrug resistant. So for polydrug resistant, usually there's no resistance to rifampicin or uh, uh, that patient will be regarded as having uh, polydrug resistance. The moment you see rifampicin resistance, then you have to think about things like MDR or XDR. Next. So how do we uh, make a diagnosis of uh, Douglas and TB? I, I, I didn't want to give you a, a I, I tried to use a different approach here because these are important uh, issues regarding how you arrive at a diagnosis of Douglas and TB. Uh, otherwise, it's just as simple as just asking someone to do drug test and uh, gene speed up gene expert, and you get your results, and gene expert is uh, positive for rifampicin, and then you have drug test. And it's that it's, 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 it's that simple. Uh, at least that's what we see on the ground. That's what people do. You just send speed down, you receive a result from the lab that says rifampicin is detected. Therefore, you found a drug test and case. But it's quite, it's more than that. So first of all, it requires you to have a high index of, of suspicion. The, almost all of you here on this platform are clinicians. So as a clinician, it's very critical for you to identify a possible uh, presumptive DRTB case. Uh, this will require you to understand who is at risk of uh, drug resistant, uh, developing drug resistant TB. So those patients that you, who come for retreatment, uh, especially those who've been treated within the past uh, five years, last uh, five years, those are at higher risk of uh, when they come with a retreatment case, those should be on, on a high alert. Those who we classify as treatment failures, those we classify as those to follow up, and patient, people who, who have come in contact of drug resistant TB cases. So this should raise this as your index of su suspicions. Then we also require you to, to, have, uh, to, to have clinical skills. These clinical skills are cardinal. So a detailed history and the complete physical examination is, is essential for when you're waking up with, uh, these patients. So when you're doing your clinical history and physical examination, it's expected that you should be able to document everything that you are discussing with the patient. So what we are seeing that uh, when you visit facilities, the patient's file, if at all it's a file, we just, we just have a patient's uh, uh, name, the results from the lab, and the treatment card. There's nothing else about the patient. You don't know whether, if you know that the patient is a minor somewhere else, it's just, you know that the patient is a minor, but that is not re recorded in your, in your notes. You know that the patient is married with six kids, but that's not recorded in your notes. You, you've kept the information to yourself in your mind but you have not translated what you've discussed with the patient on paper or whatever platform you're using to record the patient's history. So that documentation is essential. It's even got legal implication uh, for your information, okay? So when you are evaluating these patients for history and physical examination, the symptoms and signs for patients who have drug resistant TB are not different from the patient that who have drug susceptible, susceptible TB. So they'll probably present to you the same way cough, fever, night sweats, but you may, not, you, may, you may not know. But unless you go back to your high index of suspicion that I'm talking, talked about area, where you start to uh, risk category, uh, stratify the patient, whether this is a patient of retreatment case, is this a patient who has failed before? So that's now, in combination with your history, will, will make you suspect this is potential uh, patient I'm dealing with as potential drug test and TB. Then you need to, uh, to know and understand your diagnostic tools. So for you, DRTB can only be confirmed by laboratory means. We do have provisions for clinical diagnosis of DRTB cases. You can still diagnose clinically if everything fits, but we want everyone to make every effort to make sure that you confirm the diagnosis and TB microbiologically. So using laboratory means different tools are available. The first line 
is your, your gene expert MTB Reef, and now we have Outra. So just a fancy gene expert. You see, Outra is just a fancy gene expert. It's a gene expert that went to private school, <laughs> so to speak. Okay. Then we have uh, other uh, diagnostic modalities that, that, like true nuts. We also have uh, first line AOPA, second line AOPA. We also have uh, culture uh, that they use to test uh, for uh, phenotypic DST. We also have access to whole genome sequence. This is very advanced technology now I'm talking about. So all presumptive cases must be subjected to a gene expert. Uh, testing. And the good thing is about uh, the good thing about it from the weekly data that we we discuss in the, every Thursday in the National TB Situation Room. That I encourage encourage all of you guys to be joining. We have uh, every Thursday at 14 hours we have a special meeting just discussing this information on in, on on Thursdays afternoon. Please get in touch with your co your coordinators. They will be sharing the, the link. I encourage all of you to join. Your input to be very valuable for this for this meeting. So. Uh, we see that every, every uh, almost everyone, uh, our testing for gene expert is, is reaching as high as 97, 98 percent, which is a, which is a good thing. Okay, so be aware of all these diagnostic tools that you can use to make the diagnosis of drug resistant TB. Next, so here I'm showing you a, a simple algorithm. Okay, it looks complex, but it's a simple alg algorithm where. In, in, the, in the box that is highlighted in red, those are the results that you tend to get from, from, the, from the lab. So when the sample is subjective, with the sputum sample or whatever sample that is available, if it's positive for TB, it tends to be de detected as MTB detected. Now, when MTB is detected, the machine, gene expert machine, will immediately provide alternative information regarding the, the status of refampicin. Refamp so your re complete results, should indicate that MTB detected, the pharmacy resistant not detected, or MTB detected, the pharmacy resistant detected, or MTB detected, the pharmacy resistant indeterminate, or MTB detected, or, or if it is stress, you should get all this information. Okay? Then from this information, then you are going to make a correct decision or want to do what, what, what to do uh, next. So I, I noticed, I forgot, I, I, I forget the percentage. I noticed that a number of, 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 of patients, a number of you during the poll uh, for the last question is what I'm talking about. For the last question, most of you, a good number of you opted to start the patient either on treatment uh, for first line uh, when they only have results that are incomplete. So the trick there in the question was that the results were incomplete. So if you remember the question, the last four question just indicated that you have results that says MTB detected, nothing else. So those results are incomplete. So please refrain from starting patients on treatment with incomplete results. To get the complete results, it just requires you to call your, fr your friend in the lab or take a walk to the lab and ask them what, the, what has happened to the fan and resistance. So please uh, be, uh, be alert towards that. The, for patients who have uh, trace results, if they had the history of TB within the past five years, that, that patient should again be evaluated. Okay, these are the patients that you want to refer a patient the sample for DST, and then you have to use your clinical judgment whether this patient didn't indeed requires to be treated for TB or not. So the the, 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 the idea there is that uh, so, uh, when the, the machine detects the gene, the DNA, the, the machine just detects the DNA. So the DNA, uh, once the machine picks as MTP detected, the DNA does not tell you that uh, this is an, uh, alive or dead. Remember that uh, you can get a, a sample from a, an organism that lived 50,000 years ago and decide what DNA is. It doesn't mean that that organism is alive. So for patients who have uh, been treated for TB in the past uh, five years, there's a very high likelihood that you may not be dealing with active, active TB disease. So these patients require proper evaluation. So if the picture does not fit, okay, if the patient is not sick, you have time to send the sputum for DST. Okay, no one is saying that you don't, don't send the patient back home. You have to still evaluate to make sure that he, this patient is not having active TB. 
one of the best ways to get, you can confirm that the patient is not having active TB is sending the sample for a DSE culture. When the culture is positive, then you know your patient is, uh, has uh, TB. The other scenario, talking about the RR indeterminate. So for when you have a patient who has RR indeterminate, the best course of action is to treat the patient as a drug susceptible TB. You then you repeat your expert, expert test, testing and send samples for uh, further testing in terms of uh, LPA 1 and 2 and the phenotypic DST. DST. But the patient should be started on your, uh, on your face, face, face line. So these patients sometimes are wrongly uh, treated as uh, MDR, MDR, MDR TB. Okay? So again, if you, if you pay attention to your patients, most of them will present, will give you an opportunity for you to even do your DST uh, culture and LPA1 while they are waiting for, for these results. You can start, start the morning uh, on your uh, treatment. Okay, next. Yeah, so now we'll talk a bit about the uh, uh, treatment. So what you are seeing there is uh, all new recommendations that will, will be oriented, reoriented again very soon. But you, are, you have this opportunity to know that now we are introducing a new treatment regimen. So we have two options for shorter treatment regimen, rather three options for shorter treatment regimen. So the first, the first option that is the preferred will involve bedaquiline, levofloxacid or moxifloxacid, linezolid, methamphetamine, pyrazimate, high dose uh, isonazide, and clofazamide. So this will require you to treat a patient for intensive phase of four to six months, and then the continuation phase for five months. The alternative treatment option will be to give a patient a four to six months of intensive phase of levofloxacin, betaculin, clofazamine, ethambutol, pyrazimate, isonazide, and ethionamide. Then in the continuation phase, is five months that you give a patient for levofloxacin, clofazamine, uh, pyrazimine, and ethambutol. So the only difference between these two regimens is that instead of giving a patient, in the, in the first regimen there, you will be giving a patient two months linezolate, while in the second option, you begin a, a patient ethionamide for four months. Those, those are, those are, that's the key difference between these two, uh, uh, two regimens. Then also where it's indicated that we have good news is that we, it's, it's, it's good news in the sense that at least for the, for the, for the sake of patient, we have, we have we introduce a new regimen that will simply be called the BIPO regimen. Uh, BIPO regimen will involve uh, uh, betaquiline, which we, we are already familiar with. Then there's a new drug called pritomanid or PA. That's a new drug. It's called pritomanid. And then we've got the linezolid. So this, this uh, WHO has now recommended the use of this drug programmatically. That means that you can now use it to prescribe to prescribe to patients who qualify. It's not for everyone. So you be you require this will require to to prescribe in conjunction with your uh, with your CEC uh, members. So this this treatment is for now reserved for patients who are struggling with the pre x TB or those who are patients who are going to who have what we call intolerant, uh, who are intolerant to all these other drugs, or those patients who have uh, difficult to treat uh, MGR TB. So any of these patients who will qualify will need to be started on, M, uh, on the BIPO regimen that will be given for six months uh, in conjunction with the, with the CEC. I'll talk about the CEC shortly again. Next. So the, what we've been using before, or the drugs that we've been using, these will now be restricted to longer treatment regimens. So they would, we no longer have a shorter treatment regimen that will involve, that we've been using before this year. So the, 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 what, we, what we are using now, we'll be using them as a longer treatment regimen. So the consideration for these patients will only be uh, for those who are not eligible for, to receive shorter uh, treatment regimen, or those who have extensive forms of drug resistant TB, those are the ones who, be, who qualify to be treated on a longer treatment regimen. 
So it's, it's, it's important to understand that the world has now moved towards a patient-centered approach in terms of, uh, of management. That means that when you are deciding what to treat a patient, always put the patient at the center of everything. Uh, there's no patient who wants to be treated for 24 months, for example. If a patient qualifies to be treated for six months, there are no contraindications, then you treat them as such. Okay, next. So the other common form of drug resistant TB that you, you will seem to see, that's up to 15% of all drug resistant TB uh, is the INH monoresistance. So INH monoresistance is diagnosed on first line, LP and phenotypic DST. So this means that initially your gene expert may miss it. In fact, your gene expert will miss it unless we have a cartridge that will be able to pick uh, INH monoresistance immediately. For now, we do not have such a cartridge, but in the future, in the near future, we will have such a cartridge where it will give you both INH monoresistance and infarpicin resistance. So for, for INH monoresistance, for you to confirm INH resistance, you have to wait for the first line LPA or for, for culture. But something can alert you to a possible uh, INH monoresistance. So for example, this is a patient whose smear is persistent positive. Despite them being adherent, they are, they are following, your, your, they are following your, your guidance, but you will notice that your, their sputum, sputum has remained a positive at the end of the intensive phase. So these are candidates for possible INH mono uh, resistance. So those are the two uh, uh, treatment options. So these are the options in children have not changed because the kids don't qualify for most of these uh, newer, newer drugs. So we haven't changed much on the option for drug resistant in children. So this should be my last, my last slide. So it's a very interesting graph, but I will, I, will, I will put it very simplistic for you. When you have a patient, usually you want to treat them as an inpatient and outpatient. But we are supposed to use a multidisciplinary uh, uh, approach towards treatment, treating this patient. This, this means that it's just not you as a clinician in chest corner that is involved in the management of those patients. We have the uh, pharmacy team, we have the lab team. So all these are involved in the treatment of, uh, of uh, these patients. We also have, uh, you should be aware that in every district, there's a clinical excellence committee. Some facilities have even at the facility level. So this clinical excellence committee are, are, are experts who are learned in this uh, in management of drug and, and TB. And if, you are, if we can all deliberately make it a habit of sending them even a text message when you have a case, calling them or reaching them, reaching them out to what? No matter how simple the case may appear to you, always inform your CEC that we have a case of uh, drug resistant TB that we've detected our, at, at, at our facility. So we have uh, monthly uh, virtual meetings. Previously, we've been doing these virtual meetings twice, twice a month. But now, because of time and the people's engagement, we'll be using them. Uh, we'll be doing them once a month. So again, you need to reach out to your to your facilities, your facility for coordinators to share this information whenever such a meeting is taking place, so that you continue learning about uh, drug resistant uh, TB. Next. Okay. There we have it, network. I think this this has been a very loaded um, uh, session, and um, I. I am particularly impressed at how Dr. Mputu has managed to compress um, a whole book in uh, under an hour. So thank you so much for taking us through that. So colleagues, I'll quickly run through the polls and then we will have a discussion on the, on the, on the subject as well as um, get to do the, um, the, 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 the case from Cabo Women and Newborn Hospital. So quickly, in a few seconds, uh, going through each poll. Uh, poll question number one, just to assess if knowledge has, um, if learning has occurred. Poll question number one, what is the recommended action for expert RR indeterminate results? All right, I'll just let this run for a few seconds so that uh, we quickly move to the next uh, segment of our session. What is the recommended action for expert RR indeterminate results? While people are polling, those that may have questions, please post them in the chat box, and then very soon I'll enable you to ask your questions. Uh, you may uh, 
uh, show your intention to ask by raising a hand and I'll give you an opportunity to speak. Okay, um, I will quickly end the poll for now and uh, show the results. So for this one, Dr. Mputu, we have the majority that think A is the correct answer that we should treat with first line drugs and refer the specimen for culture and drug sensitivity testing. Your comment on this one? Yeah, so, so, so those who picked A, uh, thank you. That's, that's what we, we wanted you to, to learn from the question. The, the, whenever you have ara ara indeterminant, uh, please start the patient first line, but don't end there. Ensure that you have done further testing. This includes uh, referrals for, for, for culture and the phenotypic TST uh, testing. Right. Thank you, Dr. Amputu. The next poll question reads, in which category of patients should an expert MTB detected trace result be interpreted with caution? be interpreted with caution for treatment decision. A, a patient without a history of TB in their entire lifetime. B, a patient without a history of TB within the past five years. C, patients with history of TB within uh, the past five years. I think, um, ah, okay, I saw, I, I was about to say there, there was a repetition. And D says, uh, patients with a history of TB and prior treatment more than 10 years ago. There we have it, Network. Um, I'll leave it on for a few seconds for, for you to poll. And uh, so far, very interesting polling results that we are seeing. Okay, so again, I won't wait uh, till we get to the 50% mark. I'll end the poll here and display the results. I think we have a representative sample. So Dr. Mputu, the majority thought um, C was the correct answer. Yes, I'm actually, I think the numbers have reversed. I think, was it the first, I, I can't remember what was the score at first, but at least uh, people, some people managed to hear what I said in terms of uh, who to be careful about. Are those patients who have uh, had TB within the, the past, uh, the last five years? So the, the trace, trace results is usually related, is also related to the burden of uh, bacteriological load as well, as also to even to the quality of sputum that you, that you, you, you submit. So uh, thanks for those who picked C. Well done, network. Um, moving on to the last poll question, uh, it reads, what is the recommended course of action for MTB detected? Um, I beg your pardon. I'll launch that again. What is a recommended course of action with a laboratory result of MTB detected? Option A, start for FTC dose dependent on weight. B, request a laboratory to provide RR status before starting on treatment. C, start the patient on treatment and ask the patient to come after two weeks with a new expert result, gene expert result. D, repeat sputum gene expert. Okay, very, very, very interesting voting pattern. I'll just give it a second or two just for one more person to give us their thoughts. Right, so I will end the poll here and um, display the results for you all. So we had the majority, 56% uh, thought uh, B was the correct answer, which was to request the laboratory to provide RR status. And um, uh, that's before starting the patient on treatment. And then we had a few that thought um, A was the correct answer that you should start for FTCs, uh, weight dependent, and then a few were split between C and D. Dr. Mputu? Yeah, so for those who, who picked A, I, I will say this again. The, 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 the trick of the question was to show you that you, for you to pick if the results was complete. So when you get results, it just says MTB detected. The results are not complete. So it becomes very difficult for you to start treating, treating, treating patients. So the background to this question is that this year and last year, we've had a lot of patients who are treated wrongly for drug susceptible TB when indeed, in fact, they are drug resistant TB. Because all, when, when we went through the, the files, we found that 
the majority of those patients only had incomplete results on their files. So all, the, all of them had results that just indicated MTB detected. But when we went to the lab, we put the same results from the machines. We found that actually they had the drug uh, resistance resistance. So this is not the, this is what you need to be careful about. Make sure that your results, when they come from the lab, they are complete. Complete results means that you, the rifampicin resistance factors should be indicated on the results as well. Especially those of you who receive re results that are handwritten. The best is to get results from the machine. If you can't so you can't see you can't do that for one reason or the other, the handwritten results should be complete. MTB detected, rifampicin resistance detected, or rifampicin resistant not detected. Right. Thank you so much uh, for that, Dr. Mputo. And colleagues, this should not be complicated. It just requires a phone call to the lab, and yeah. we don't have to send the patient back home before we confirm. Just a phone call. For those who have um, laboratories that are doing these tests at your facilities, you could just simply walk there and yeah. confirm, uh, as opposed to asking the patient to come the following week. There we have it, colleague. Thank you so much for taking us through this didactic presentation, Dr. Mputu. I'll hereby uh, open for five minutes or so uh, for the network that may have questions or comments on what has been presented so far. Earlier, I saw there was a hand from Gloria Mundali. Gloria, do you still want to give us your comments or thoughts? Right, Gloria is unavailable. Um, colleagues, any comments, questions on what's been presented? Right, Chief Wembe from Sefula, please go ahead and unmute. Give us your comment, question, or contribution. Hello. Please you are ahead. able to get me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Um... Remember, remember, I might have joined late, but I somehow followed. But maybe I just need your advice or something. Um, apart from uh, do, collecting the sputum for culture or gene expert and anything, and apart from maybe, probably if you would like to take full blood count, what other tests can you do which can supplement your treatment? Thank you. Before you go, please just repeat the question. We, we, we didn't hear you clearly. You, Tim Fuembe. Hello? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask, uh, apart from doing the, the culture, the gene expert and all the other, yeah, or the full blood count, is there any other test that you'd like to do to this client that you can try to facilitate your your treatment just in terms of monitoring. Okay, so I think if I heard your question correctly for clients that you're investigating for drug resistant TB, other than gene expert, uh, what other tests can as be in done? Monitoring, not investigation, as in monitoring. Oh, for monitoring, what tests besides yes. but can you use? Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. Uh, before Dr. Mputu answers that question, allow me to also invite Mumomba to give us his comment, question, or contribution. Mumomba. Yes, uh, Dr. Singini, good afternoon. Dr. Mumomba here. And um, thank you very much, Dr. Mputu, for the presentation. Um, just maybe a clarity, Dr. Amputu, there is um, this uh, addendum for, for, for TBMDR, which was released in 20, 2019 uh, in regard of um, um, uh, the regimen to be given. And I've seen the, the, the changes which have been made. Uh, but uh, there is uh, uh, also in the addendum, the shorter arrangement, which actually was given um, uh, for a shorter period, something like six, six months, 12 months. And uh, it was actually mentioned that uh, that short arrangement is given based on the patient prefer uh, preference, as well as um, um, the clinical finding. And uh, in the addendum, it was actually mentioned that that should be given 
on a sites where um, uh, operational research is being conducted. So uh, just an inquiry, um, what uh, has been done so far for us to, uh, for the short arrangement was, um, did we reach to a conclusive um, uh, resolution based on the research on uh, the outcome of the short arrangement? Or um, we have a scenario where it was not even uh, conducted. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mwamba, for your, your comment. So I'll invite Dr. Mputu to respond to, to those questions, and then I'll get through to the chat. OK, so I'll, I'll go with the first question from Chief mm -hmm. Yes. I uh, was asking about the alternative way of monitoring patient apart from culture, if I, if I understood your question. So I'm, 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 I'm assuming you are asking this question because you may have had a patient or two that you are looking after and you had no idea how to monitor them throughout their treatment. Maybe because you, have, you are having challenges accessing uh, culture results or sending samples for, for culture. I'm, I'm, I'm just an assumption. You can let me know if that's not the situation. So for monitoring treatment response for patients who have drug resistant TB, unfortunately, you can only be sure if you are doing cultures, okay? So the, the, the most important thing for you to, is, to, is to know is within your district, what courier systems are available and how to, do you ensure that you get your feedback uh, on, on time? Uh, if, you, if you can't get, I don't know which, where Sefula is. Western province. Western province. Ah, in Western province, you have a very good team there. And there's Dr. Albert Stad is a very dedicated young man. I call him as a young man. His hair is, high, his hair is white, but he's very young at heart. So it's a very good uh, clinician that you can engage if you're having challenges uh, in terms of accessing uh, things. He's a very humble man who calls me. He's very well senior than me, but he calls me, asks me questions and guidance for me. So in other ways, I'm available. If you're having challenges accessing culture results in terms of monitoring your drug, drug resistant TB patients, please do get in touch with Dr. Stali. You can get in touch, in touch with me directly. Otherwise, we do not have any other means of uh, or monitoring these patients if they are responding to treatment or not. As for now, we, we, we rely on culture. We can't use gene expert for monitoring. That's, that's, not, that's not possible. So only culture for now. I hope I've made that clear. So for Dr. Mungomba, so the, the, the addendum that the, in 2019, there were two addendums actually. Uh, there was a March addendum and a September, uh, September addendum that was giving guide, uh, guideline up to how to treat patients on drug rest and TB. So I'm very much aware of the September uh, addendum, but that, that, that is what we've been doing since, since 2019. We've actually been putting patients on a shorter treatment regimen and longer treatment regimen. Uh, uh, very soon, we are, we, we are already in the process of uh, analyzing the, the data of uh, what were the responses to this shorter treatment regimen or uh, whether they actually worked or not. So that was the operational research that you were referring to. So we have the information. So just a matter of sitting down and uh, clarifying. But, the, but that shorter treatment regimen that was in that 19, uh, 2019 addendum is going to be over, over superseded now by the, 2020, by the 2022 National Consolidated Guidelines that are going to be launched very soon. So we already have made all these uh, guidelines and, 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 and you will see that we, we no longer use that, that, those shorter treatment regimen from that 2019 addendum. The drugs are still valid. We are using those drugs now in treatment or in, in, in constructing uh, the longer treatment or individualized treatment uh, regimen. So for now, we are moving along with the rest of the world in which in terms of uh, first line uh, shorter treatment regimen. So that, like, I, like, like I showed on the, on the screen earlier on. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mputu. And uh, also just invite Winnie to give us a comment on the, the lab services available for DRTB, rather for TB diagnosis, particularly um, a follow-up on DR patients, uh, building on the question from uh, Chim Fuembe. Winnie?
Okay, um, Winnie is unable to, to speak at the moment. Um, Marshall, any comments regarding the, the session? I know you've really answered uh, most of the questions in the chat box, and thanks to you, um, most there's no pending question. Any comments from you, Marshall, as we get to the case for today? Yes, okay. so just to mention that um, I think from Chimfembe, uh, apart from just doing the, the monitoring, that is using the, just monitoring the progress being made, we also need to make sure that we monitor these patients for, for, for side effects. So there, there are a lot of tests which you can do depending on the drug the patient is on. So there are, uh, there are investigations which you can do like a full blood count, uh, ECG, you also need to check the creatinine, the liver function tests. Um, you also need to, to check for the women if they, they are pregnant. So you have to look at the, the drugs they are on. For example, if the person is on the nasal lead, you, you may need to, to, to check for the full blood count. We know the side effect of that. It causes suppression, so you need to do that. Uh, for bedaquidine, we know that it can cause prolonged QT, so you need to do ECG. So the other monitoring part is to check for the side effect for the, for the drugs. Otherwise, most of the things have been covered. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marshall, for, for that comment. Um, so I'll share the screen now. Kawe uh, Women and Newborn Hospital. Um, I will invite you to, to take us through the session, uh, the, the presentation, the case and then we'll continue with the discussion. Margaret, Dr. Lubasi. Dr. Lubasi, Margaret Lubasi. All right, um, we might be struggling to have um, Dr. Lubas take us through the session. I'll go through the case and then um, once Kabwe is available. Ah, I see Kabwe, Kabwe is unmuted now. Please go ahead, Kabwe. If you are speaking, we cannot hear you. Please make sure that you are using only one device for audio in the room where you are. If there are multiple people using different devices, we're getting a lot of feedback. Good afternoon. Are you uh, able to get me now? Loud and clear. You can go ahead. Margaret, do you prefer sharing the screen from your end or I can carry on? You can carry on. Uh, is everybody able to hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good afternoon, Network. I'll be your presenter for today from Kawa Women Newborn and Children Hospital. My names are Dr. Margaret Lubasi. Okay, so for our case presentation for today, starting with the demographics, this is a case of ML, male 13 years old, who resides in Chiwombo, Chikukulu village, Chikukula village. His date of birth, 8th August 2008, Christian by religion. So in the past medical history, there's no history of diabetes, no history of epilepsy, no history of sickle cell disease, no history of asthma. And this is a patient who is RVD reactive since 2009. He was first diagnosed with TB in 2019 and he received the, the treatment. His first relapse was in 2020 and his second relapse was this year, July, 2022. So the history of presenting complex, this is a patient who came into our facility as a referrer from Chiwombo Health Center he was well until a week before admission when he had started presenting with a productive cough accompanied by chest pain 
that the patient described as sharp and had intensified with coughing. He also had a history of excessive night sweats and dyspnea on admission. The patient also complained of the abdominal pain of moderate intensity associated with constipation and loss of appetite. No history of nausea or vomiting was collected. Drug history, this is a patient who on the day of admission was on art, the following regimen, DTG, TAF, and FTC. On admission were occurring adherence. The patient on admission was currently on HCT for a month. That was his third time since 2019, and he was being under dose. Uh, on further interrogation, it was found that he was receiving one tablet of a Tambuto and one tablet of 3FDC. Patient was also given paradoxin. So family history, there's no positive family history of diabetes, no positive history of epilepsy, no sickle cell, no asthma and no TB contact, no positive family history of TB. On the immunization history and the maternal history, neither, neither the caregiver nor the patient was able to recall any of the history and there was no under five card available. On the social history, the child lives with both parents and is the eighth child in grade three. So an examination, on the day of examination, on the day of admission, which is 15 August, 2022, the general condition of the patient, the patient was ill looking, those pala plus plus, jaundice plus, and the patient was not cyanosed. He was in obvious respiratory distress. The vitals on admission, uh, the oxygen saturations were at 97% on O2, respiratory rate 30 beats per minute, temperature of 36.1 degrees Celsius, pulse of 121 beats per minute. The anthropometry, he had the Weight of 21 kilograms, the Miwak was 15, the standard deviation was normal, and the height was 121 centimeters. Finger club, visible finger clubbing was observed. The chest, on examination of the chest, respiratory system, he had marked bilateral crepitations. Cardiovascular system, S1, S2 was heard and tachycardic. The abdomen, there was mild tenderness and palpation with visible fresh tattoo marks and hepatomegaly. Next slide. So for our treatment and investigations at our facility, on the day of admission on the 15th of August, 2022, a chest x-ray was ordered and done, which showed a collapsed lung fluid and infiltration suggestive of, P of TB. Uh, the x-ray will be displayed after this slide. An abdominal ultrasound was done, though the slightly enlarged liver and bilateral renal pathology. Urea creatinine LFTs was ordered. Unfortunately, we're having some difficulties with the reagents which are out of stock and controlled in our facility. The urine MCS was done, which was normal. The full blood count and di differential count was done. Our hemoglobin levels were 5.3 grams per deciliter, white blood cell count of 24.5, and platelets of 338. For the viral load copies and CT4 counts, it was ordered and as of now, we're still trying to trace in the database the recent viral load copies and CD4 count. Cut and tat was ordered and the patient was initiated on Keptriaxin and Septrin. On the very same day, the patient was reviewed by our chest clinic and corrected on the dosage of the ATT where he was put on a Tambuto, four tabs, three FDCs, four tabs, vitamin B6, and the art regimen changed to ABC, three TC, DGT, BD, twice daily. Patient was also on folic acid and coxacillin and maltivit. In continuation, the chest x-ray, Uh, continue. So our questions of the facility are as follows. Our first question, what could have caused the TB relapse? Our second question, how do we rule out drug resistant TB in this patient? And our third question, how can we manage this, better, this patient better? 
Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Lubasi, for the, this very interesting um, case of um, a 13 year old in Kabwe who was referred from Chibombo. Janet Wick, I'll invite you for comments, questions, and clarifications on the case uh, so that Kabwe can clarify and then we'll start tackling these questions one by one. So we have a question from Dr. Mputu first. Hi, Dr. Luasi. I have uh, just some quick, one or two questions. The first one, uh, at any point uh, during the care of this child from 20, uh, 20 through, for the past three episodes of, of TB this child has had, was there any, at any point, TB confirmed bacteriologically? through sputum or stool, whatever means it was, which was done. And then the second question I have is, was there any attempt to do uh, contact tracing, to visit, to visit their home, to see if there's anyone else who could be the source of uh, these infections? Right, thank you so much, Dr. Mpoto. And um, one additional question is, what was the role of the antibiotics in this patient? Uh, it's coming in the chat for why was safe reaction and cloxacillin given in this patient? Maybe you could clarify those three. Okay, so for the first question, if TB was bacteriologically confirmed for this person, this patient, this was our first contact and we, up to today, we've been trying to trace with the local facility to see if they have any of those results which haven't yet been found in the database. Then for the second question, also uh, at the level, we've communicated all the findings here and at the level of the local facility, they paid a visit to the patient's family and are trying to trace if there are any other suspects of TB or positive TB contacts. Then for the antibiotics, for the ketriaxin and cloxacillin. So on admission, this if you we were covering the patient on a broad spectrum antibiotic because the flu, full blood count shows an elevated white cell count. And at the same time, the cloxacillin for the tattoo marks that were observed on examination, both in the chest and abdomen, infected tattoo marks. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for your feedback. Uh, Kawe uh, Women, Newborn and Children's Hospital. Um, so colleagues, moving on to the actual case that we have, based on um, the information we have received, let's then get into the discussion to find out what could have caused the relapse in this particular patient. So I'll open it up uh, again to the network. Anyone that would like to give it a, an attempt before I get to the subject matter experts? So I see in the, in the chat, uh, Mazabuka General Hospital, someone at Mazabuka General Hospital thinks it's, um, it's because the child was being underdosed. Very interesting observation. Really, the child was being underdosed. There's a hand from Matua Mbao. Please unmute and give us your comment or question. Uh, good afternoon, Network. Uh, I think one of the reasons why the client was not uh, uh, treated well or they had those relapse, one of them is I've seen the child was on tapet. And uh, I did not hear that the DTG was doubled. And also Tafed was not a good treatment. I don't know uh, the comment from the team if during the treatment, the child was receiving a different treatment than the Tafed and the DTG was doubled in that treatment. Over, thank you. Thanks for your submission, Bao. Um, any other comments? Uh, let me ask uh, one of the experts on the call, Dr. Zico, your thoughts on what could have caused this relapse? Okay, yeah. So uh, there is the underdosing that's, that's been highlighted. 
but um, we also do not know the, the adherence of this child, uh, knowing that this is an adolescent, we know that adolescents uh, generally do not have good adherence, uh, be it to ART or TB treatment. We also do not know the um, immune status. We, we don't have those other parameters such as viral load and CD4 count, which would have been very helpful to enable us assess uh, how this patient is doing also with regard to the other um, comorbidity, which is uh, HIV. Um, but um, maybe since I've been given this opportunity to, to speak, I just wanted to comment also on the antibiotics that were commenced. Um, at the point the infection was suspected due to the leukocytosis, uh, before beginning the antibiotic therapy, um, you should have collected um, some samples such as sputum, uh, urine, uh, blood cultures, and then you can begin your broad spectrum antibiotic therapy. When you get results for those culture results, you can then either escalate or de-escalate your antimicrobial therapy. Um, that is to ensure that uh, you do not begin antibiotics which may change or alter the um, the picture of the bacteria that that you may be suspecting. So it's always important to try as much as possible to target the the bacteria, the the actual bacteria causing infection. And so you do that by collecting the necessary specimens, and then you subject to 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 antimicro uh, to to microbiological testing, and this is very important in this patient whose info whose um whose immune uh, immune status is not really known. Um, they could be affected by many many bugs out there. So it's very important that we try as much as possible to identify which bugs are causing the problems in the patient. Over. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zico, for that submission. Um, there's, there was a question um, in the chat box which was asking if GeneXpert was done from Cabo Women and Newborn Hospital, coming in from uh, Jackson, where we're from Yeta. I think later on we'll ask you to comment on that. And then, um, Marshall, give us your thoughts on um, how we would rule out DRITB in this particular patient, considering the circumstances in which this patient uh, presented to the hospital and uh, what's been done so far. Thank you, Dr. Singini. The, 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 the first thing, our... yes, uh, we are seeing TB relapse. It's query relapse because from the beginning, we, we don't know. There haven't been any confirmation of the TB and look at how frequent this has been 2019, 2020, 2022. So we need to look out for, for something else. We know that relapse can be uh, ourselves making it or the patient or some of the drugs would have, we would have provided. So the best thing we can do to help this child is uh, for the hospital to quickly get samples, uh, do expert, and also get some samples and uh, we send for, for culture and, and DST. So please, uh, uh, Kabwe, is near to, to, to CDL, so the sample can, can move as soon as possible so that they can start working on those samples. But meanwhile, the first thing they should do is to do gene expert. This is a, this is a, a child, uh, 13 years, that, that age is enough for the child to produce sputum, and the sputum can be examined. Thank you, Dr. Singini. Thank you so much. And Dr. Mputu, any other uh, thoughts to so, add? So I wanted to... Uh, to my thoughts on question one, uh, like Marshall said to say, are we querying TB relapse or we are thinking this patient has a TB relapse? If you look at the clinical presentation of this child, this child for me has a finger clapping. It means that you are, you are potentially dealing with someone who has the underlying uh, lung damage. Probably it came, if, the, if the first TB episode was one that was confirmed, maybe that's what has led to this underlying uh, uh, lung damage, probably bronchiectasis. Looking at the, the finger clapping, uh, TB relapse shouldn't cause the finger clapping. Uh, you may be dealing with someone who, who keeps coming with the recurrent bacterial infections, like Dr. Zico was trying to say. 
Uh, this is a patient that you want to make sure that you've done your MCS and uh, confirmed uh, lab if they have uh, MCS identify a bug that can be uh, treated appropriate with the with antibiotics. Uh, TB TB relapse is a very difficult concept to de to define. Actually, uh, we, we use this term loosely most of the time, but it's a very difficult concept to de to define. So I, I would want to be sure that the, uh, this child. Has, has been exposed, like Marshall is saying, has done an, a gene expert. Uh, we have uh, different modalities. The teenagers old should be able to provide some sputum. We have alternatives to prove that the patient has TB or not. Uh, we have uh, urine lump strips. Uh, uh, you have stool gene expert. If you, the patient can submit uh, uh, your sputum, and this is one way that you can want to investigate if this patient has drug resistant TB. Uh, or not. It would be nice if we actually knew that at every episode this was actually bacteriological confirmed uh, confirmed TB. But uh, that's, that information is not clear. Right. Thank you, Dr. 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 Mputu, for that. Now, Mlenga Musonda, I see your hand. Please go ahead with your question or comment. Mlenga Msonda, uh, please go ahead with your question or comment. I see your hand is raised before I invite Dr. Kozia to also just speak to question three on the management of this um, adolescent. Okay, Mlenga is not, uh, Mlenga is not uh, speaking. Dr. Ziambo, any comments uh, on the, how to manage this patient? Right. Do Hello. Uh, is that for Dr. Ziambo? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I'm Dr. Civile uh, sitting in his place. What's the, you have been following the case. Uh, so you want us to speak on the TB side or the HIV side? Uh, the TB side. <laughs> okay. Pardon? Yes, the TB side, and you could speak to the HIV component considering the, the, the relationship. Okay, uh, ju just give me the summary of the, of the findings again. Sorry, I missed right. the TB aspect when you are. Yeah, this is a 13 year old uh, with background of the respiratory tract infection that was mimicking TB and was previously treated with um, um, what we have defined as low dose of anti-TB therapy, um, which uh, was the uh, ethambutol and the three FDCs, but under dose for the weight. And this child is HIV positive, who was uh, previously given uh, um, TAFED and later on transitioned to ABC3 TC DTG BD. So salient things to take note was once the patient, uh, while the patient was on the the ATT, the, 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 the HIV medication, the DTG was not, uh, was being given once a day and uh, did not receive the second dose. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it uh, regarding the, 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 the case. And I'll just- Yeah, yeah I didn't hear the TB test. The, the TB test, I didn't hear that. Yeah, there's no- the Gene expert. There's no result for gene expert that was done and the carboid tail uh, informs us that they sent a sample uh, for gene expert, but was rejected because it was contaminated. So we don't have a result as at now. And the lamb test, was it done? Lamb was- This is an adolescent? Yeah. Pardon? Dr. Lubasi, can you confirm if lamb was done? But the presentation indicates that there was no lamb done. Uh, and perhaps the, the reason. Uh, the lamb is out of stock in our facility by really? that time. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and the previous TB, you said this patient was had TB in the past, right? Yes. How was the TB diagnosed, the previous TB case? Sorry? 
the previous TB, how was it diagnosed? We tried to trace that information with the facility, but they've not been able to give us any of the results for the referral to our facility. Okay, and what was the duration before between the TB diagnosis, the previous treatment and this presentation? Two years, less than two years, 2020, and the current one was in July 2022. Okay, yeah, so, so th this is a, because we don't have a diagnosis on this patient, we don't have uh, how the HIV status is, is, I mean, in terms of whether the HIV is controlled or uh, uncontrolled, but the patient had this visible finger clubbing and that X-ray that you see uh, does have some, I know it's not so clear, but it looks like it has some fibrous bands the x-ray you can see over there are some fibrous bands. So somebody who has HIV positive and has some, some, some previous TB, we assume it was TB diagnosed and, and comes with clubbing and the pneumonia. As you can see here, uh, uh, almost one lung is washed out. Uh, you start thinking of as uh, some bronchiectasis uh, uh, as a differential. Uh, and so like Dr. Zico had mentioned, very important for such a patient who comes with a, a recurrent pneumonia that sputums are collected uh, because the, the commonest uh, uh, bugs that you'd expect to be bugs that fit on some necrotic tissue like pseudomonas or some other anaerobic bugs which you need probably special treatment. So that sputum test was critical in this patient. I, I, I did hear that empiric antibiotics was given, but you want to ensure that you know what you, you are treating uh, be, uh, be, 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 because this is now a complicated uh, pneumonia, it's recurrent and so on. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, this is a 13 year old where we are with a washed out lung. We can't uh, uh, neglect COVID. It's such a white washed out lung is something to think about. As you know, HIV infected and adolescents who likely are not doing well in terms of compliance and treatment, they, 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 they do badly. The CD4 will be down. We haven't heard about the CD4 test in this patient uh, and the viral load as well. So in, in short, I'll reiterate what Dr. Zico had said that I think it was critical that samples were collected in this patient. Uh, if at all, this is a pseudomonas, uh, we prefer that you give some drug that to cover, uh, it, it was bronchiectasis with some clubbing. I mean, you prefer to, 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 to empirically give drugs that to cover for pseudomonas as well. Uh, so in that list will be drugs like high dose levofloxacin and so on. We know that we are scared of TB, but if you are going to do the test, at least you can give within a week or so, you will not cause resistance as long as you continue treatment, unless you prolong it over a month. Uh, and I'm sure Dr. Z, Dr. Mputu has shared what we found in the uh, in the. A, a, a TB drug resistance survey that uh, uh, we don't have so much of quinolone resistance. Yeah, so you sh we shouldn't really be scared. So th that that would be an optimal management for 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 this patient on the on the chest infection. This could be TB. It can't be TB as well because of that clubbing on the fibrous bands that you see. And it's a very common scenario that you have people coming with several episodes of TB. Uh, uh, treatment but without a diagnosis yeah obviously if it's if 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 it's tb you consider the mdr a, a, a type or other things like this is an hiv patient maybe failing like mac you know that's non tuberculosis mycobacteria uh, like mac but the x ray for mac should not really look like that it should be fib i mean uh, it should be cavities and nodules 
you know, nodular cavitatory type, not fibrous bands like you see. So with the flan with the with the clubbing, the fibrous band, I would error to think that this patient has some form of bronchectasis. You know, the lung got destroyed because of the previous TB, and now you have this pneumonia sitting in uh, to cause causing problems. And uh, with good treatment, we've had adolescents at least have taken care of one where you've managed to sterilize the lungs uh, 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 and the treatment has to be slightly extensive. I remember I had to use uh, a carbapenem for, for my patient who is now alive and was an adolescent with a similar picture. Uh, I think him even had a lung collapse at some, in some area. So briefly, again, to reemphasize collection of samples. Right. I don't know if, if, if that's helpful from our side. Yeah, that, that, that's very helpful, Dr. Dr. Seville. And um, uh, on the side here, Dr. Mputu was just whispering to me that we really need to emphasize the need to make every effort to confirm TB using laboratory methods. And Winnie has also just texted about that in the chat box, speaking to um, the fact that efforts need to be made to collect sputum uh, for culture and drug sensitivity testing in this patient and several other patients with similar presentation. So I ask Dr. Mputu to just give us closing remarks, remarks as in bullet form as we wrap up. We are already beyond time. In a bullet form for the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think Dr. Sivid has said a lot. So. Like we seem to have said, what Dr. Sevilla has put it, what Dr. Zico said, uh, what Marshall said, and what Aria said on, is just speaking to the same, uh, to the same thing. The best thing you can do for this, for this child is one, first time to confirm if you are dealing with TB, if you can make every effort to test those results. I know those results are variable. Uh, if, you have, if you're having challenges tracing those results, please get in touch with me. I'll find them for you. I know who to call. Secondly, uh, you can do your sputum uh, MCS uh, because of the underlying potential underlying lung disease, lung disease that this child has developed. You may be dealing with the, uh, a pneumonia or the current pneumonia that this child is coming with. So let's ensure that the, this child has a chance to have a proper sputum MC, MCS, uh, MCS done. And then uh, you have to uh, check his HIV status, ensure that he's not failing, uh, especially that his issues of uh, adherence and the under dosing, we can you ensure that this child is not is not failing on the uh, on the treatment. So we need to do the need for viral load, so that the the child can be properly and comprehensively uh, managed. This child can actually be stabilized, although the lung disease may not be curable at this point. But this child this child can actually be uh, treated in such a way that he can remain uh, infection free for a very long time with his underlying lung lung condition. I'll end here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mputu. Thank you to our subject matter experts, um, Ms. Winnie Mwanza, Dr. Lunga Zico, Dr. Sivile, um, Marshall. Really, really thank you for your inputs uh, and contributing to this session. And above all, I'd like to thank uh, the team from Cover Women and Newborn and Children's Hospital for that case and the discussions we've had. Um, also just want to thank Ndola College of Nursing. I see a number of you in attendance. Uh, it's really good to see you taking part in this session. So thank you so much. And from the entire team here in the hub, would like to, to wish you a pleasant week and um, have a great day. Thanks and we're signing out. <laughs>